As we said earlier and read earlier, it is Palm Sunday, the Sunday preceding Easter on the church calendar when we commemorate and remember Jesus riding into town on a donkey. And again, it proved to be his last Passover celebration, something he certainly knew fully uh, and was fully aware of. Uh, And then we gather next Sunday for the highest and most revered Sunday of the year. Yes, Christmas gets a longer celebration, something that I criticize on a regular basis. But Easter is the the high point of the Christian calendar, the biggest Sunday of the year, the event that changed everything. But that's for next week. This Thursday, again, we will gather for the last hour service. And the reason we began that service, among others, is because if we did not have that service, then what we do have is we gather on a Sunday for Palm Sunday, and we hear and sing about shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we gather next week and hear shouts that he is risen with nothing in between. And of course, both of those things are true. The king has arrived, and he is risen That's why a lot of churches have Good Friday services to to get that portion of the story. And we've simply combined the Good Friday idea with the Lord's Supper on Thursday night. But all of that got me to thinking, maybe that's the way we like it. Maybe we like to go from the triumphal entry to the resurrection and not have to think about everything in between. Maybe we like the celebrations without the suffering that goes on in the middle. After all, we like to celebrate, we like to rejoice, we want to be in a good mood. We'd much rather put aside any thoughts of struggle and pain and flip toward the end of the story where everyone is happy. And that is a common view of Christianity. Life was horrible and miserable before I met Christ, but since I've met Christ, everything is wonderful. God is blessing me daily, and Jesus has taken away all of my sorrows and pain. And while that might be a common view, it is simply not realistic. Nor is it what the Bible says we can expect after coming to faith in Jesus. Quite frankly, the Bible says the opposite. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. Jesus suffered and was persecuted, as did Paul, and so will we. I've titled this sermon from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, The Whole Picture. And after I sent that out on Thursday to the people that need to get it so that it can be up on the screen for you, and I decided I didn't like that title. But it was too late to change it. Because I'm not giving you the whole picture this morning. In fact, I'm only giving you a part of the picture, but I am giving you the part of the picture that we often don't think about. That's why I initially thought the whole picture was a decent title, because I wanted wanted you to see the whole, but the reality is we see quite often the positive side. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which is true, but we don't often see the other side of the suffering and the pain, the suffering that must precede glory. That was true in the life of Jesus. Before we can come to the empty tomb next week and rejoice, we have to go through all of that suffering. And it is similar in our lives as well. Before we get to the glory that is reserved for us in heaven, there is some suffering and pain that we must endure in the here and now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. Paul writes, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith 
for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. You will recall that this section of Scripture, Paul is defending his ministry, and it's been going on for quite a while now. He is defending his ministry while he was in Thessalonica because he had been attacked and persecuted, and as a result, he had left the city prematurely, and now there are others in the city, perhaps even in the church, who are trying to tear it down by saying things like, if Paul really cared about you, he would have hung around, but he left. Last week, we talked about his separation anxiety how he felt burdened because he was not able to be with them physically and because he had no news of their progress. And that's hard for us to understand these days because we have instant access to news. I mean, even if we are separated from somebody physically, we can text them, we can email, we can FaceTime them, we can do the old-fashioned thing of actually using our phone as a phone and talk to them. We have multiple means by which to stay in touch with people, none of which Paul had. Our culture has changed quite a bit, of course, but the heart of ministry and Christianity itself has not. And so there is much we can learn from Paul's ministry and how he lived his life during this particular period of it. Now, we've said previously that every believer ought to have some sort of ministry. That is, all of us are called to serve in the local church, and certainly all of us are called to be running the Christian race or life. And so the first thing we notice from Paul's experience is that Christianity is sacrificial. He understood that his life calling was to be lived for the benefit of others, not just for himself. Or as the Bible says, we are to think more highly of others than we do of our own selves. Now you say, well, where do you see that in this text? Well, we see it, first of all, in the fact that he unselfishly embraced pain. He felt their burden. He says that twice in verses 1 and verse 5. When I could bear it no longer. We saw the emotionally charged language last week where Paul used a word that was a word for orphan, only we said that it wasn't just a child that was orphaned from his parents. It was a word that was also used to refer to a parent bereft of his children, separated from them. It was a word used to to speak of someone who, who had died. And Paul is using that terminology here because the weight of their spiritual growth is resting upon his shoulders. Now, that is not to say that he thought they were dependent upon him. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was in control, but he also knew that God uses people to accomplish his means and, as we discussed last week, that there was a great enemy that was desiring to destroy their faith. Now, I'm not asking you to bear the burden of the world, but I am saying once again, we ought to be concerned about the spiritual growth of the people that are in our lives. Do we wrestle in prayer over the progress or lack thereof in the faith of our fellow believers? I think it's often the case that we do not, that we're not concerned about them, and frankly, sometimes we're not even concerned about our own spiritual growth, and we cannot be and will not be concerned about the spiritual growth in others unless spiritual growth is a priority in our lives personally. So instead of running from pain, Paul unselfishly embraced the pain of others for the good of the gospel. We notice also that he unselfishly embraced isolation. Have you ever been asked if you have a life verse? A life verse is a little more than a favorite verse. A favorite verse is just a verse you like, but a life verse that some people have is a verse that they really identify with and it's a verse that they seek to apply to their lives. So I think I've probably told you before, but this is my life verse right here in verse one. Finally then, brothers, when I could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind in Athens alone. When I get tired of the ministry, when I get tired of people, Just leave me in Athens alone, preferably in the fall on a Saturday afternoon or evening. 
Now, of course, that's not the way Paul is meaning for this verse to be interpreted. You will remember that the mission team consists of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And after being run out of Thessalonica, they made their way to Berea. But the persecution from Thessalonica followed them to Berea, and Paul was forced out of that city as well for his own safety, and he went to Athens. Timothy and Silas remained in Berea with instructions from Paul to follow him as soon as possible, and at some point they did that. But in our text, he says here that we, along with the word alone, one thing we do know for certain is that Paul, uh, Timothy was sent back to Thessalonica, as we'll see in just a moment. But was Paul indeed alone in uh, Athens, or was Silas there with him? It is possible that he sent Silas somewhere else in Macedonia, perhaps Philippi, but it's also possible he's using what we sometimes call the, the literary plural or the we. Sometimes I say, we've been talking about. The reality is I've been talking about it. But sometimes we say we just to include everybody, and it's possible that's what Paul's doing here, although not likely since he does use the word alone. But ultimately, we do know that they all are later reunited in Corinth, from which he's writing this letter. Regardless, Paul is sacrificing by unselfishly embracing isolation. He wants Timothy to be with him. Timothy is a help and a fellow worker in the ministry, but he also wants to know what is going on with the fellow believers in Thessalonica so that he can be a help to them. So he sacrifices his own ministry to send Timothy. The word for left behind there, it's a word that means to be abandoned. It was a word used to speak of a loved one being left behind at death. It is, again, another emotionally charged piece of language that gives us an x-ray into the heart of the Apostle Paul. We tend to view Paul as this strong type A personality type, and perhaps he was. This pioneer, this church missionary that went from town to town setting up churches and establishing them. But if you read his letters carefully, you'll see that almost all the time he had co-workers with him. Read the introductions, read the conclusions, and you'll see how many people he had surrounding him. Even though Paul gets the vast majority of the credit for all of this, there were many other people who were working alongside him in ministry. And therefore, he longed for them to be with him. But here, he intentionally sends them out as he does on other occasions. It happens to us here sometimes as well. We've sent out some good members through the years. We've got two at seminary right now. We've got two, or should I say three, that are about to leave us once again and go right back to the mission field. These people go and they get their education or they get a ministry somewhere else, never to return to Beaver Dam. And while that hinders our work here locally, it is a plus for the kingdom of God globally, and therefore we rejoice when we send out people, when we lose members for these kinds of reasons. So likewise, Paul felt the pain and isolation of losing Timothy for a while. But he understood that ministry and Christianity require sacrifice on our part for the good of others. But secondly, we notice that Christianity is purposeful. That is, what is this sacrifice all about? What is the reason behind it? Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica for a purpose, and that purpose remains the purpose for which we minister and live we notice, first of all, that that purpose was to strengthen their faith. The word for establish means to put in a buttress or support. Our faith is only as strong as the foundation upon which it, as it is built. And if our foundation is weak, then the remainder of the structure, that is our life, is going to crumble. We've talked several times now about the fact that they were new believers, probably just months in, not years and yet they were experiencing persecution and did not have a mature spiritual believer with them to walk through these difficulties alongside them. And so in the midst of this persecution for their faith, the easy thing to do would be to deny their faith, to go back to their previous lifestyle, to apostatize, 
as the word we often use, meaning someone who has professed faith in Christ and then later denies it. But keep in mind, all of us need strengthening in our faith. Whether we're a new believer or a long-time believer, my faith is not as strong as it needs to be. And neither is yours. <clears throat> we all stand in need of constant strengthening <coughs> for whatever lies ahead. So how do we go about being strengthened and helping others to be strengthened in their faith? There's really no secret answer here. There's no mysterious key that unlocks all of this. It goes back to the basics of Christianity. Ultimately, Christ is the one who strengthens us, and therefore we must abide in him. We must prioritize our ongoing relationship with him. We cannot be strengthened in the faith if we are not connected to the one in whom our faith is. And therefore, that must be a priority. Certainly, the Holy Spirit working within us is the one who strengthens us in the inner man, and that means that the strengthening comes from the Word of God and the work of God and alongside the people of God. As for the Word of God, no faith can be strong without a knowledge and an understanding of the truth. And such understanding is only gained by consistent time spent in reading and studying God's Word. And we talk about that all the time. But it is not possible for your faith to be strengthened and strong if your reading and studying of the Word of God is shallow and sporadic. Here again, we are not expecting great revelation every time we open the Bible. God doesn't primarily work in that manner. He, can, he strengthens us over time as we consistently read His Word, obey it, and apply it to our lives. And that includes our work and service for him. It is not an either-or equation. Our study of the Word of God should lead us to apply the Word of God, and that means to be actively involved in the work of God. And as we involve ourselves in his work, we are strengthened further by seeing not only the transformation in our own life, but the transformation in the lives of others. I don't think I've told you this before because I don't like to appear to be bragging, but I do speak multiple languages other than English. I took multiple different languages when I was in high school. I can speak German, for example. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Do you speak German? Ja. Jawohl. I can speak French. I took that language as well. Parlez-vous Francais? Oui. But you've heard about all that I know. I might could come up with a few other words, but that's it. Even though I took those languages for multiple years, that's all I've retained. And you know why that is? Because I didn't keep at it. I just took it the year or two that I was supposed to take it, and I haven't done anything with it since. Tracy and I occasionally talk about learning a language together. We always think that that would be good and fascinating. I think people that can speak multiple languages are fascinating, and I want to be one of those people, but... We've never done it. Virtually every year we talk about it, and we've never done it. And you know why? Because it's hard work. I mean, you can't pick up a language in a sitting. You're not going to sit down this afternoon and read a grammar book in some foreign language, and suddenly you are proficient in that language. It takes time, and over time, you, you, learn, this you learn this lesson and that lesson, and over time it builds until eventually you do become proficient, but it takes a long time. And such is the truth when it comes to the Word of God. My Bible reading this morning did not radically change my life. But over the course of time, as we open up the Bible day after day, week after week, year after year, God uses that to make us proficient in his word. And as we become proficient in his word, it strengthens our faith. Paul says the second purpose of Timothy's ministry, the second purpose of our life in ministry is to encourage your faith. It's very similar to strengthen, but different enough to, to settle it out separately. We've talked about the word of God and the work of God, but here we see the importance of the, word, of the people of God. The word for exhort is similar to the word for strengthen, but it literally means to call to the side of. 
Timothy is physically being called to the side of the believers in Thessalonica, coming alongside them to encourage them, but more than physically, he is doing it spiritually. You and I need to be an encourager in the faith to others by being involved in their lives. That's part of what being in the church is all about, God's visible family. There is a growing desire among many of the younger generations to forsake this aspect of the faith. I don't need the church, they think. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's just me and him, and I've got his word and his spirit, and I need nothing else. And if that is your attitude, it will be detrimental to your own faith and to the faith of others in the church because we need one another. We need to be strengthening and encouraging one another. Oftentimes we leave church and we think to ourselves and maybe even say to someone around the lunch table, what did you get out of church today? Well, maybe we need to be changing the question and we need to be asking, what did you put into church today? Who did I encourage by being at church today? Whose faith was strengthened because I ministered to them today? That's what we see in Paul and Timothy here. The last point I want to make flows from the previous. Our faith needs to be strengthened and encouraged because Christianity is painful. It is not a life of ease and bliss. There are going to be difficulties and there are going to be problems and we need a strong faith to help us through those times. And it is also true that those painful times serve to strengthen our faith so that there is a reciprocal relationship. As I walk through difficulties and Christ brings me through them, my faith is strengthened. And as my faith is strengthened, I am more ready and able to go through difficulties. We've stated previously that the Thessalonians were enduring persecution because of their new faith. And rather than hindering their continued growth, it had actually served to encourage them exactly what Paul had predicted. Notice that Paul says, these things you're going through are not arbitrary. They did not come about because of chance or your lack of faith. Paul says, I repeatedly told you this was going to happen. Why are you surprised? We said this when we were there. You know, without a proper vision of Christianity and what it's all about, we are sure to stumble when difficulties arrive. Let me give you an example. If you are to adopt the false premise of the health and wealth gospel, that is that Christianity is is all about God providing all the money we need and all the health we need and getting us out of trouble every time it arises, then you're going to stumble and fall when those things come. Because preachers who preach that kind of assurance do a grave disservice to the faith. Because when trouble does come, the only answer they have for you is that the problem is your lack of faith. So now, not only the problems that you're going through and the struggles that you're dealing with, but now it's your fault because of your lack of faith and you don't have a church community to encourage you because they're saying the same thing. It's your fault. You don't have enough faith. If you'll just have enough faith, all of this will go away. But Paul says, no, we told you problems and difficulties and suffering and persecution are not arbitrary. In fact, God allows them into our lives to strengthen our faith. And if we don't see that, our faith will be destroyed. We also notice that their troubles are not isolated. That is, everyone will experience them. This is not something reserved for the spiritually immature or the spiritually mature. Neither can you escape difficulties in life by recommitting yourself to the Christian disciplines. It's just a fact of life that troubles come to the righteous and to the unrighteous. We live in a fallen world that is filled with sinners, and as a result, trouble is going to come in some measure to all of us. Now, granted, some people experience more than what seems to be their fair share, while others seemingly experience less, but it is not isolated. Paul was writing all the believers, and it still applies to all of us, that we are going to go through these things. It is not isolated. He kept telling them in advance that this was going to happen. 
I'm telling you the other side, not the, the half of the picture that we don't often hear or see, and that is these are the normal part of the Christian life. It is the part of the Christian diet that we're all going to have to go through. So don't be surprised when it comes. And certainly don't allow such troubles to deceive you to believe that God no longer loves you. The word for moved there is a word that originally referred to the wagging of a dog's tail. I know you wouldn't have gotten that in English. But initially that word referred to the dog wagging his tail. Now when does a dog wag his tail? He wags his tail to get attention or to get something he wants, among other reasons. And so eventually the word came to mean agitate or disturb. So what Paul is saying is don't allow afflictions to get your attention and to disturb you. Know that they are going to come. It is often heard on the lips of believers. I, I just don't understand why God is allowing fill in the blank. Now, I'm not trying to make light of your troubles. I realize that some of you have experienced troubles that I can't even possibly comprehend. But in whatever form and to whatever degree, don't let them surprise you and make you question the nature and character of God. He does love you. Calvary proved that, as we will look at later this week. So no trouble you are currently enduring should change that. Finally, we notice that troubles are inevitable. Paul says, we are destined for this. We don't like that, do we? Destined for heaven. Oh, I can get on board with that. Destined to, for eternal life. I like the sound of that. Desperate to live, destined to live in the presence of God forever. Preach that. But destined to suffer? It is part of the Christian faith. Paul had not proclaimed an easy believism that led to a casual Christianity. He had proclaimed the whole picture, which included the promise of trouble. James Wright, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Consider the man who found a cocoon of a moth and took it home out of curiosity to watch as that moth was going to emerge from the cocoon. And one day there was a small opening which appeared and he watched for several hours as that moth struggled to, to get out of that cocoon. But he seemed to be stuck. And so the man finally decided he would take a small knife and make a small sliver in the cocoon so that the moth could emerge and that is what he did. The moth did emerge, its body large and swollen, its wings small and shriveled. The man expected that moth to to get stronger and to ultimately unfurl the natural beauty of its wings, but it never did. The moth spent its life dragging around a swollen body with shriveled wings because by God's design, it is the struggle of the moth coming out of the cocoon that forces fluids into the wings so that they can be strengthened and grow. And without that struggle, it doesn't happen. It is God's design for you and for me that we go through difficulties in life. And James writes, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Well, how in the world are we supposed to do that? Does God expect us to just ignore the obvious and rejoice in the midst of trouble? No, we've got to remember the purpose. James goes on to say, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We can rejoice in the midst of troubles because we know they are a normal part of the Christian life and they are present for a reason. They are not arbitrary means by which God is punishing us and they are certainly not evidence that God no longer loves us. Instead, they are lovingly allowed into our lives to strengthen and encourage our faith. And then we can be used by God to do the same in the lives of others. Again, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. As a pastor, I believe one of my main responsibilities is to do exactly what we see in this text, to strive to strengthen your faith and encourage you. That is why we place a priority on the preaching of God's word. 
Again, I realize that you don't walk out of here every single Sunday he's going, well, that was a great sermon and that really transformed my faith. I don't think that's the way it happens. And I also realize that we could do other things that would attract a larger crowd perhaps, things more exciting. But superficial worship will not prepare you for the day of trouble. And make no mistake about it, the troubles will come. And how you handle those troubles will go a long way in strengthening your faith and encouraging you as a believer. But being prepared for that is the key. Why do so many people walk away from God? Why do so many people quit when difficulties arise? It's because they've not been adequately taught that it's a normal part of life and they've not strengthened their faith for the day of trouble. Perhaps they erroneously believe that faithful believers wouldn't have difficulties. Perhaps they erroneously believe that, that God's love means that we will only have good things in this life. But whatever the reason, the ultimate issue is, it comes down to what we believe because what we believe about God and our faith will manifest itself in the way we live our lives. And that is why we strive to anchor ourselves in the word of God. I was in my weekly book club meeting with some other pastors this past week and we got to talking about the idea of a vision for the church Years ago, it's not so common anymore, but that was a big buzzword a few years back. Or, what's your vision for this church? And what people usually mean by that is like, what's your five-year plan? What, what are you going to do to help us grow? What ministries are you going to add? And on and on. And I've always said, I don't have some grand vision. In fact, I told you a few weeks ago in January what my vision was. To proclaim God's word to make immature believers. I mean, that's what the Bible's called us to do to teach the word so that we might faithfully live our lives, reaching other people with the gospel and coming alongside and encouraging them. It's not flashy, but over the course of time, it's fruitful if we stay the course. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the life and ministry of Paul and Silas and Timothy for their faithfulness, even in the midst of difficulties, and may we learn from them that we are to remain faithful in our own difficult times. That these difficulties are not you punishing us, they're just part of life, just part of what it means to live in a fallen world. So may they not take us by surprise, but instead may we prepare for that day by strengthening our faith by encouraging and exhorting one another as others do the same for us so that we will not turn away, so that we will not apostatize, but instead, like those believers in Thessalonica, we will continue to grow and bear fruit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I want to leave you with a strange benediction. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. You're dismissed.